What? You need right. A Got it. Okay. Well, I'll wait until Graciela's at her seat there. When is her term up? At the end of this year? I guess it's one year for them. Columbia or MJC? If I can get you all to come to order, thank you. Uh, I'm going to call the the regular meeting of the Yosemite Community College District Board of Trustees for September 12, 2018, to session. And if I could all please to get you to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here. And before we get started, I just want to take care of a couple housekeeping uh, items here. We're going to go through uh, all up until prior to public comment because we have one board member that may need to leave and under our board policy, in order to act on anything, we need at least four board members. So that's all we have up here. So to get the business of the board done, and the purpose of that is so we can all all of us up here can hear from you and give you the adequate amount of time uh, to, to come up and do public comment rather than it being rushed because we've got these other things we need to get done. So that's the purpose behind it. So also, uh, I want to remind everybody again, we want to hear what you have to say. I've said it before, um, try not to be repetitive. Uh, try to comment on things that others have not said because we want to hear every idea and every comment that you have. Uh, let's keep uh, uh, this as a board meeting with decorum and civility. I appreciate everything so far. It's great, the sea of red. Uh, I think, uh, Curtis, you probably haven't seen this much since you left Cuba, right? Probably. <laughs> there you go. So um, I appreciate all of you being here. And uh, it's great. Usually, usually we get 10 people. Curtis, I'm going to call you out. You know that. Um, so this is, this is great to see everybody here. Uh, again, we usually don't get this much. So to have you all here and, and allow you to be heard and your voices to be heard, we all appreciate that. I know I appreciate that. So again, we're going to take some items out of order, and then we're going to get to public comment, OK? So with that. Uh, we'll move on to report out from closed session. We do not have one, uh, so that was pretty quick. That's item 3.2. I'll move on now to item 3.3. Approval of the minutes of the August 8, 2018 Board of Trustees study, study session and regular meeting. So I'll give my fellow trustees a moment to look over those minutes and then entertain a motion to approve. Um, Chair Garrett, I move that we approve um, the minutes of the August 8th and the August 27th meeting with the corrections that were handed out to each of us on the dais. Okay, so that's approval to, or a motion to approve both item 3.3 and 3.4, correct? Yes. Okay, is there a second on that? Second. Don, you got it. So seconded by Trustee Viss. Any further questions or discussion? Hearing or seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We'll move on now to the consent agenda. And let me get to that. This would be items 6.2 through 6.9 on the consent agenda. Does any trustee wish to pull any item or uh, before we approve, does anyone want to comment on any item on the uh, consent agenda? Mm -hmm. I'd sort of like to ask a question on the purchase orders. I was going to head to the same place. Go, so go, go for no, it. Go ahead. Well, I just want to make sure that the amount of money that we're paying to Lucian is, I'm asking, is that, are we getting our bang for our buck on that? I don't know who to ask. I, I see that our IT person isn't even here, so. Uh, Roger is not here tonight, so I will take a stab at this. Okay. Um, and. Uh, 
Gina can probably help me out. Uh, Lucian is the system that by which all of our um, operations run, essentially. So all of us use this in one form or another um, for the operations of the college. Since Roger has been here, um, he has been negotiating uh, the prices down on the various modules that we um, use. So um, we have to have an ERP system. There are limited, um, limited, shall I say, uh, players in the market, and we are using a Lucian, and even so, he has been working on negotiating those prices down. So I would say that, yes, we are getting the bang for our buck. Thank you. My question was, is it related to the um, purchase orders for our attorneys? Yes. Are those bills or are those authorizations for purchase orders not to exceed that amount per the authorization? Authorization. They're okay. not bills. Okay. That was my clarification. So that's the point I wanted to clarify, rather. Okay. With that, uh, is there a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda? So moved by Trustee Viss, seconded by Trustee Hallinan. And the other thing that I would like to add is with respect to the out-of-state uh, travel, uh, that I appreciate the um, expedience of which people are getting those to the Chancellor's Office and the ability to pre-approve those based upon their priority. So I want to thank the Chancellor's Office for uh, getting those moved through quickly. So with that, all those in favor, yes? Here, Garrett, at uh, the trustees' seatings, we provided a correction to one of the travels. Okay. Did you have that? I have it right here. It's on the back. So it's just indicating for those out in the audience and indicating that uh, this is being charged to a restricted account. That's the change. Okay. So with that correction, is the motion still standing? I'm seeing yes. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We'll now move on to... Item 7, which is the action item 7.1, special appointment to the VIP slash JPA Board of Directors. And I'm seeing Jaeger and Pimentel. So this is a routine and customary business item. Is anyone going to comment? I am. Okay. Um, if you look at the recommended, oh, excuse me, if you look below the recommended action, the special appointment. It says that um, each member shall designate one alternate director who may be either be an elected official of the member's governing body or a management level employee of the member. I don't recall this board's ever discussed who we want that to be, whether we want a second board member appointed or it seems that someone wants uh, another management level employee appointed, but we've never discussed that. So currently we have Trustee Rojas serves on this as representing the governing body, correct? That's correct. Okay. So is in any other eager member of the board wanting to sit on that? Well, I, understand what I think there needs to be a discussion. If we can do that in the future tonight, I understand we're trying to rush through this. But it really should be discussed, I think, by the board at some point. Tom? Okay. So we go ahead and prove it as okay. written. So is there a motion to approve item 7.1, which is that the Board of Trustees appoint Ms. Susan C. Yeager to the management level employee position and Ms. Dorothy Pimentel to the alternate director position for the two-year term beginning October 1st, 2018 and expiring on September 30th, 2020. With So moved by Trustee Hallinan. Seconded by Trustee Viss. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Move on now to item 7.2, the 2018-2019 Yosemite Community College District final budget. And I'll turn this over to our Vice Chancellor of Finance for Fiscal Services. On 7.2? Yep. Okay.
Chairman Garrett, um, while we're doing this, I would note that we also need to have a vote on 7.1. I apologize for not. On 7.1? We just did vote on that. Okay, I'm sorry. I got confused. Okay, so um, we have before you for your the 2018-19 final budget for your review and approval. Um, the this presentation unfortunately is a little longer than I would normally do, but because of the new student-centered funding formula, there's a bit more information. I am going to though skip over some of the detail in this presentation. I wanted you to have it, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over every single line as we move through. Um, on this page, this is the um, fiscal services uh, website, and this is where we post our budget documents. So you can see here there are links to prior budget documents. This is where we'll post anything that we present to the board or moving forward, uh, things that we present in uh, meetings, either uh, you know, to uh, district council or any other meetings as we move forward um, in the interest of transparency. So the state budget was adopted on June 27th, 2018. It included a $78.4 billion increase for K-14 funding, and that's obviously very good news for community colleges. Um, the last five years have been the best budget years for community colleges ever. Unfortunately, the gover governor has tempered that good news with a series of one-time initiatives rather than really giving a lot of that in ongoing funds due to fears of a, com um, a imminent recession. And that would be imminent for pretty much the last eight years. So um, this is the uh, chart that the governor has included in most of his budget presentations for at least the last four to five years. And what you'll note from this chart is that the, the uh, red line is the current expansion period. And you can see that it is creeping up on the longest expansion period of 120 months um, since uh, World War II. And so we really are coming up at the longest expansion ever. By the two, end of 2018-19, we will have matched that. And after expansion, typically comes recession. So the talk is everyone knows when's coming. We don't know the time frame, but you know, in the next uh, few years is a pretty good bet. The 2018-19 state budget, um, the Prop 98 general fund support for community colleges included the student-centered funding formula, so there was $581.5 million um, included to implement this new formula. It was very controversial up to the bitter end when it was uh, signed into law by the governor. And what got a little lost in that controversy was there was 100 million in one-time money and 20 million in ongoing funding to establish an online community college. And that college is to be uh, administered out of the state chancellor's office. So um, additionally, there was 46 million to support the California College uh, Promise, California College Promise Program, and that is for a free college for uh, the first year for eligible students, and the Student completion, Success Completion Grant of $40.7 million. This will uh, consolidate two existing financial aid programs and provide uh, grants of 649 per semester to qualifying students who enroll in 12 to 14 units and 2,000 per semester to uh, qualifying students who enroll in 15 or more units. What's interesting about this is that it does dovetail with a student, student success metric in the student-centered student funding formula 
Uh, studies show the longer it takes students to achieve their educational objectives, the more likely they are not to achieve those objectives. So by incentivizing them to take more units, they will finish faster and hopefully that will um, show, um, have an impact on our success uh, metrics. Here we just show some of the other programs which include um, funds for full-time faculty hiring, part-time faculty hours, the K-12 um, Strong Workforce Program, and the Adult Education Program, which was formerly called the Adult Education Block Grant Program, a name I finally got used to and will now have to remember another name for. Moving to the student-centered funding formula, in order to get agreement on this and have the legislature um, enact the law, um, they agreed on a three-year implementation. So the first year, uh, there will be there are three pots of money in the funding formula. One is based on the allocation is based on FTES and then supplemental, um, which applies to things um, like um, Pell grants and. Um, AB 540 uh, students and um, those students receiving the California Promise Grant. And then student success, those factors include, um, but aren't limited to, associate degrees, associate degrees for transfer, and credit certificates awarded. So for the first year, the, the allocation will be based on 70% FTES, 20% supplemental, and 10% student success. In year two, that will change to 65, 20, 15, and by year three, the pots will be 60% FTES, 20% supplemental, and 20% student success, which is where the funding formula began uh, with the um, governor's budget in January. So FTES is calculated on a three-year rolling average of current year, prior year, and prior prior year. And so the stated intent of the average is to have districts that are actually, have actually ex experienced declining um, FTES to reset to that new level. So summer shift is still allowed, but unlike um, with the prior formula, SB 361, the purpose of the summer shift was to allow uh, colleges to stay at a certain level. And so you saw a lot of the um, peaks and valleys. And, and at any given time, over 30 uh, districts throughout the state were in stability. So this is designed to have colleges, uh, districts actually reset to the enrollment they are actually achieving within on a three-year average basis. So um, the summer shift allows us to control how we manage that reset over time. There is a hold harmless provision through fiscal year uh, 20, 2021, and um, the hold harmless provision does not mean that you get exactly what you receive, that a district will get exactly what we received in 2018-19. Particularly, um, this applies if you're on the, and I use this word in the way the chancellor's office has been using it, the winning side of the formula. If you're on the winning side of the formula, your, um, your total computational revenue can decrease in year three if your um, data, if your factors do not hold steady. So if your FTES is declining, if your um, student success metrics go lower instead of higher, et cetera. So you can, your revenue can drop. On this uh, page, we see the student-centered funding formula. You can see the state allocations. YCCD's portion of the base was 70 million, supplemental 25 million, and student success, a total of 9 million, was allocated to YCCD. This page just shows you our um, total computational revenue um, from year to year, and you can see we had a fairly big jump between 2017-18 and 2018-19. This chart shows a total of about 7.9 million. However, in 1718, we got um, some unexpected one-time money from the state to make up for prior years. The actual difference in our computational revenue is approximately $8.9 million. So 
for new money in 2018-19, we have the 2.71% COLA, which is approximately 2.6 million. We're assuming no growth or access, uh, growth um, funds because we don't show any trends for growth. And then we have the um, impact of the new funding formula at about 6.3 million. So in total, our new revenue is $8,851,000. So um, first off, it's important to understand that this is an estimate and that it can and likely will change. So for one thing, the um, I just told you that the the three-year average is, is actually based on our FTES in 1819 uh, plus 1718 and 1617. So we clearly don't know what our FTES is going to be in 1819. Secondly, um, the metrics from 718 for supplemental and the student success, um, that data is not due to the Chancellor's Office until I think October. And so we won't know where we stand until um, probably early next year in terms of what our actual allocation will be. Then there are other um, items that we have to take into account when we look at this money, and that includes increases in STRS and PERS, step and column increases, uh, the shift from the 70-20-10 allocations to the 60-20-20, because there is an impact to the district with that. Uh, the actual FTES the district has been achieving and uh, other district priorities. So on CalPERS and CalSTRS, I, I know we've talked about this a lot, so I'm going to suffice it to say that um, we've already seen approximately a $3.9 million increase um, since 2014, and we estimate based on published rates that the total increase from 1415 to 2526 will be approximately $8.5 million. And that is $8.5 million that has to be built into our base um, because one-time money runs out, whereas we need it in ongoing funds. Here we have the, um, we have show under ongoing costs, we show that the uh, $1.3 million in step and column advancements and then PERS and STRS increases. So those total 1.3 million increase in our budget this year. We also have a one-time um, allocation, but this was from prior year savings. And so we split that uh, per the resource allocation model 8515 between MJC and Columbia. We had some transfers out. Uh, the first was transfer to the OPEB Trust in the amount of $975,000. Uh, the hundred and, um, this is about $110,000 less than last year based on the recommendation of our actuarial consultant. We will be doing another actuarial study this fall and based on that, we'll be making recommendations about how we approach our um, OPEB obligation. In 2017-18 is the first year that we were required to um, give an indication about how we're, how we're intending to uh, fund our obligation. We also had, mostly from prior year uh, savings, a transfer to capital outlay of approximately $1 million. <clears throat> and this had to do with the fact that uh, we, we projected that by the end of 1819, that fund balance 41 would be very low and we needed to have money in there for facilities items. And finally, we have contingencies in the budget. And these contingencies, the first one has to do with the total compensation proposals, both accepted and offered. That's about 3.8 million. This dollar value will go up a bit because we, um, we had uh, the LTAC and the um, CSEA in at a little bit less than was actually agreed to in the final agreements. Um, so that number will go up a little bit. And then we have the one-time initiative funding of 5.4 million. And this number will go down just a bit um, because the other number went up. So this 5.4, this amount is the, the bulk of the 8.9 million. And um, most of this money will eventually need, be needed for STRS and PERS funding. But in the meanwhile, we are proposing until it's needed that it be used for one-time initiatives. Um, 
we've asked the campuses to propose those one-time initiatives uh, that they need at their campuses. We also have a, a pool repair project that needs to happen at MJC that's over and above um, that required by um, because of the pool um, accident or incident. Um, that the dollar value on that has gone up; it's almost doubled. So uh, we did we were estimating a million, but now we've actually had engineers out there and um, others, and and it has doubled. But I did just get that number today, so we have to spend some time on that estimate and figure out what's in it and and how you know we want to do what we need to do, but we're not trying to. We're trying to keep that project very tight, um, the scope very tight. Um, Susan, real quick, since you brought it up. Yes, sir. How much of the how much of our insurance is going to cover that that uh, pool repair? Well, the all of the mechanicals, um, anything to do with the um, explosion itself, will be covered. Anything that we do, and I believe that entire um, two million that they're projecting right now has to do with repairing the pool and then um, those items that were found. Um, there's rust that has to be repaired and on some steps. Um, I believe that is to do all with the replastering and repair. So I will come back to you though. As I said, I got, I got it right before I came here, but I didn't want that number to be out there and you to hear about it somewhere well, else. And these are repairs that were on schedule uh, to be done in two years and we're gonna take care of all of it now. Is that my right. understanding? So the, the idea is that the pool was supposed to be replastered in two to three years. And so now, um, because this has occurred, um, the idea is to fix those issues now, replaster the pool, and then when the mechanical um, is fixed, then the entire pool will come back online. So, so on the bottom item, the one-time initiative funding, and that's also in the handout, page five, I believe it's line 30. Um, I know this goes back to the accreditation visit and their recommendation that um, there'll be more accountability as far as funding out to the two colleges, which is where this is coming from. Um, we have already had uh, um, some transfers already of savings, and you indicated again for this year, um, doing that. Yes. Um, I know this board has asked in the past uh, for transparency and accountability. What are those going to be, uh, what is that money going to be used for? The one million? No, I'm talking about the, the initiative funding. You mentioned that, that it eventually that amount of money will be used for stirs and purrs, but I'm talking about initiative funding now. Where's the Where's the programs? Where's the sure. transparency? And it's probably not fair to you. It's probably more in the realm of the two college presidents. But Actually, I have an answer. Okay. Um, so the money is sitting in a contingency and line item and has not been allocated yet because, unfortunately, we didn't get our funding in time to take this through the participatory governance process. So that's what needs to happen. And so um, until we get our, um, our um, district fiscal services advisory committee up and running, we'll take it through district council, much like we did the budget proposal, um, I think it was last month. So it will, there will be an accounting of the money, how it was spent, there, there's not gonna, it's, it's going to be accounted for. As will, by the way, that million dollars that we transferred into facilities, it, whatever projects we do, those will be tracked and accounted for. Okay. Okay. So, um, so moving on, if there are no more questions on that page, I think this was an important page, so I appreciate it. was. Questions. Thank you. Okay. So I did want to take a moment to go over the FTES reported and achieved. The important line item on this page is the total reported FTES, and this was reported under the old funding formula, SB 361. We have, in three of the last four years, reported to target of 16,542 FTES. And the way we were able to do that was to be able to shift summer where we needed it to make that target. And the reason you see 2016-17 
at 15391 FTES is we simply didn't have enough FTES to shift in that year to make it, so we shifted FTES back and we shifted FTES forward uh, to make 16,542 FTES. And I do need to stress that that was perfectly appropriate um, use uh, of the uh, under the prior funding formula, but the state is trying to get a handle on how much FTS do we really have out there so they are switching to the three-year um, average. And so if you look at the total achieved line, you can see our actual um, FTS achieved in each of those years. And I would just note that our um, average for the last three years has been 16,220 FTES. So we're at 16,542 and our average for the last three years has been 16,220. And you can see we've been pretty consistent around that 200 mark. So if we continue in that for 2018-19, we are going to be resetting um, to that level. And we'll, we'll um, have more discussions about how we, how we do that, but we will be using summer shift to manage that transition. So finally, we have a summary of um, our state apportionment total computational revenue is 104.4 million. Our total unrestricted revenue is 111.4 million, and that adds in our um, enrollment fees and local revenue, including um, lottery, CalSTRS on behalf payment, and um, non-residential fees. Total expenditures of 113.4 million, and a projected ending fund balance of 15.3 million. That includes the 10% reserve required by the board of 10 million, a contingency of 3.5 million, 3 million of that, which is for STRS and PERS, um, which will be part of the conversation about managing um, the PERS and STRS as we move forward, and then the undesignated carryover of 1.8 million. These are just some of our restricted general fund budgets, and you can see that um, I do want to point out at the very bottom, the physical plant and instructional equipment number, that number was actually over a million dollars last year. Uh, this year, uh, we got a very small amount, and so that is being split 50-50 between scheduled maintenance and instructional equipment. Um, next is the FON, and we have, the district has met or exceeded the FON for the last five years. Um, the 2000, um, I'm sorry, that is not showing well, is it? Um, I'm not sure. There we go. The 2018-19 uh, FON will be calculated later in October, but we have met or exceeded that for um, the last five years. So finally, we have a bunch of pie charts. I'm not going to go through them. They provide more detail on the revenues and expenditures. Um, but I will say that keep in mind that the percentage share of how the funds are allocated will change once those contingency items that we discussed earlier are allocated and compensation proposals are finalized. So these are kind of where it stands now based on what's in the budget, but they will change um, once we've allocated out $5.4 million dollars and once the compensation proposals end up in their correct line items instead of being down in contingencies. So that is what I have for you tonight and I hope uh, that that was helpful and Anne, could, do you have any questions? Um, this is your only report tonight, right? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay, so I have a question um, on page five of, of... Let me grab my budget. Sorry. But, but it deals with um, undesignated, and you, you just mentioned that um, one of the sheets shows an undesignated carryover of 1.8 million. It, it's line 39 here. It says, I'm on page five of this document. On which on which line? Uh, um, line thirty nine. It on on this document it says undesignated. Mm -hmm. On the one we just went through, um, dealing with the ending general fund balance, it says undesignated carryover. Mm -hmm. And it, are they the same thing? Are they both undesignated carryovers? 
Well, the undesignated is undesignated fund balance, which means it doesn't have a tag on it. It's not part of the 10% reserve. It doesn't have um, stirs and purrs tag on it. It is undesignated. The board could choose um, to um, put a designation on it, and we are working on um, a plan for the reserve funds um, that we will be bringing back to you in the future. Um, that, uh, okay, and then, but all right, in column three, it's 1.8, and then in column four, it's 3.3. So where did the, so, that's just anticipated? Right. On page five, the number 39. You could Not, look at. Dr. Strader, are you here? <laughs> I'm going to let uh, Sarah answer that one. I think we had some savings perhaps. Anticipated. So for the other one is blue, which is nineteen twenty. Correct. Right. It's a projection for nineteen twenty, and what that is taking into consideration are anticipated increase in revenue for nineteen twenty with the under the new funding formula, and then it keeps all of the expenditures consistent and flat from year over year, except for the increase in the anticipated medical benefit because of the. Um, the compensation proposals that are on the table and have been approved up to the cap of, of 1600 so this is this is just a projection going into 1920 again taking into consideration a slight increase in in revenues but it doesn't take into consideration any other an unanticipated expenditure increases that will go up okay so theoretically that could go uh, for a variety of things, okay. And, and it can fluctuate up or down depending upon the data that's submitted for the funding formula. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I did want to um, mention one other thing as we're looking at um, the new revenue. In addition, you know, if you really just look at the new revenue versus new expenses, um, you know, they take up quite a lot of it, the new expenses. And beyond that, we have other things that the district, other district priorities, including the facilities and the IT TCOs. So there's, you know, how, how are we going to start funding those? There's also campus security concerns. So it is a matter of looking holistically at you know, what can we do until these funds are needed for PERS and STIRS, and what is the plan um, for, um, you know, funding uh, facilities, in particular TCOs, moving forward, especially if the state keeps pulling back on scheduled maintenance funds. So that's what I had for you tonight. Since you brought up the total cost of ownership, and this is when part of the accreditation process, when when is uh, the board going to get a draft proposal on that on that piece? Well, we have um, the facilities draft has gone to um, let's see, it's gone through district. Um, I'm sorry, administrative council. So I think what happens is that at the end of the month, it will go to district council, is what I think, and then I think it should come to the board next month. So um, I don't know in whether that would be for informational item or, you know, just so you have a look, first look. Is that about right, Henry? Thank you. So, um, but we do have a, a really good document at this point. So we're very yeah. pleased with it. I don't it. think it'll be an informational item. There may be uh, some comment. So give us a chance to right. delve into it. So yes. thank you. Okay, so this will be the adoption of the uh, 2018 uh, Yosemite Community College District Final Budget. And the action is that the Board of Trustees conduct a public hearing regarding the 2018-2019 Final Budget for the Yosemite Community College District, adopts the district's 18-19 Final Budget and authorizes staff to prepare and file the necessary annual financial and budget reports uh, with the required agencies. So with that, I will now open the public hearing. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on this item? Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for adoption. Is there a motion to adopt the 2018-2019 budget? 
Moved by Trustee Viss. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Demartini. Any uh, further comments, questions, or discussions? Seeing or hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We'll now move on to item 7.3, quarterly report on the district's financial condition. And this is a routine and, and customary item of business, and Sarah will go over the details with us. Yes, great. thank you. So now that Dr. Yeager's gone over the budget for 1819, I'm going to take you back to 1718 just for a minute. So before you this evening is the fourth quarter 1718 311 quarterly report for the time period ending June 30th. What this report is showing you is the actual activity that occurred during our 1718 fiscal year. You will see in section one the unrestricted general fund revenues that we recorded are about 103 million and our expenditures were about 102 million. So we did have a slight savings of about $1.7 million. Our ending fund balance is at about $17 million, which gives us a percentage of the fund balance as a percentage of our expenditures at about 17%. We did report our FTS at 16,542. We are in a strong cash holdings. Uh, we have about $33 million, so that is good for us. We do not have to request any borrowing from the, uh, from the county treasury. So if we go down to section number four, um, again, this is just showing you the percentages of our actuals to our budget. We did receive 100.4% of our unrestricted revenue budget, and our expenditures were at 98.8%. Um, the other outgo at 55%, the reason that it's not 100 is because we still had that 2% set aside for the faculty negotiations that weren't settled as at the end of the fiscal year. So that is why that did not reach that 100%. If you go to the next section, we did not settle any contracts during this quarter. We also did not enter into any debt and we do not feel that we have any significant fiscal problems going into the future. On the supporting page, um, after the 311Q, this is, this is the report that we typically show at the Board Finance Committee meeting, but this is a support we use to uh, fill in our 311 quarterly and just some highlights that I wanted to show for you guys is that um, we did receive some prior year one-time funding of approximately a million dollars, and that was recorded in the state other revenues. We also received a little bit more in our interest than we had budgeted because the interest rate was at 1.2% instead of 1.08 at the county, so thank you, county. The CalSTRS on behalf, you'll see that we have a revenue line and an expenditure line, so this is our GASB 68 requires us to record the CalSTRS on behalf contribution for um, our employees that are part of CalSTRS, and you'll see that that was at about 2.4 million for both revenues and expenditures, so the net impact is zero. That's recorded at the end of the year, so our budget, even though it shows 1.8 million, that's always an estimate because what we actually record is based off of actual payroll during the year. Going down to the expenditures, you can see that MJC spent about 100% of their budget. Columbia had a small savings with 98%, and uh, Central Services had a, they had savings because they came in at about 95%. Central Services savings stems from many vacant positions in our IT department, as well as vacant positions, a vacant position in um, the chancellor's office area. So that's why we had savings there. And as Dr. Yeager showed in the budget for 1819, we did take those savings and allocate it out to the campuses. So that's where those one-time savings went. On line 15, that's the, um, that's the transfers out in the state and the contingencies. That was where we held that 2% for faculty negotiations, and that's why we didn't expend 100% is because we didn't settle. Any questions related to the quarterly report? Any questions for Sarah? No? 
Okay, the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees conducts a public hearing to review the district's financial report for the quarter ending June 30th, 2018, and directs staff to submit a copy of the required report to the California Community College's Chancellor's Office. So with that, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone dying to get up to talk about our June 30th, 2018 ending quarter financial statement? Come on, this is exciting stuff. You came here for this, right? Okay, now I'm gonna close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for adoption. Is there a motion to approve? I'll uh, move that with a comment and say, I, I, this is a good position to be in with a, a new uncertain funding uh, program, uh, retirement costs we won't have fully paid and that inevitable recession in California coming. I think this is a good place to be uh, for us a good prudent uh, position to take uh, at this time. So with that, I'll move uh, the item. So moved by Trustee Hallinan, is there a second? Second by Trustee Viss. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. We'll move on now to item 7.4, Columbia College Major E proposed budget adjustments. Who's gonna take this or is this just something we're going to adopt based upon what we received in our packet? I'm getting a yes, okay. So y'all received um, items uh, in your board packet with, with, uh, with regards to this item. So does any board member wish to comment on it or do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Trustee Demartini. Is there a second? Second. We have a second by Trustee Hallinan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. We we'll move on now to item 7.5, personnel negotiations, YCCD slash California State Employees Association Chapter 420 tentative agreement. The recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approves the attached 2018-19 tentative agreement regarding salary and benefits between Yosemite Community College District, YCCD, and the California School Employees Association Chapter 420, CSEA, pending successful completion of the CSE's ratification process. Does any member wish to comment on this item, or is HR going to comment? I don't have any comments, Chairman, except to say thank you to both of the teams. They worked diligently over a period of several months and came up with contract language that I know that serves the interest of both parties. So uh, hats off to both teams for their hard work. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion to approve? Moved approved by uh, Trustee Viss. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Demartini. Any further comments, actions, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Move on now to item 7.6, personnel uh, consultation, Yosemite Community College District slash uh, LTAC MOU. And um, I wanna give our uh, Vice Chancellor of HR a, a, a moment to just clarify the actual uh, MOU that we will be ratifying tonight because it's not really clear in the uh, paperwork. So the application of the MOU, uh, we have a practice of applying salary increases to the salary schedules. In this particular instance, there are two separate salary schedules. One is for management employees, which are deans and directors and managers of programs and uh, frontline supervisors. Then there's a second salary schedule. It's called the executive salary schedule, which includes vice presidents, controller, presidents, vice chancellors. Um, this increase here only applies to those on the management salary schedule, and that's it. So it does not apply to that other group on the executive salary schedule. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So any further questions of the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to uh, approve this item? I'm I'll second. Okay, moved by Trustee Hallinan, seconded by Trustee Demartini. Any further questions, comments? Seeing or hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. We will move on now to item 7.7, .7, board policy second reading. Those items are listed on the posted agenda. So 
Connie is bravely stepping up to the microphone. Good evening, Chair, Board, <laughs> Chancellor, Cabinet. I should hold on a moment. Just I, I want to apologize. Before this, I've had a request from a member, uh, Jim Hohen, to uh, public comment on this item. So I'm going to give Jim a moment. So my mistake. Sorry. Chairman, Chairman Garrett, trustees, Chancellor, I'll read my comments. At your last board meeting, you were presented with an amended version of board policy 4-8067, which among other things sought to protect students' rights and beliefs. You asked the colleges to review the amended policy and follow the process, quote, from the beginning. That did not happen. Instead, the amended version a 4-8067 was short-circuited from the Policies and Procedures Committee to the District Council in a matter of hours in one afternoon, not following the seven-step procedure required by the PNP's um, committee's own, own procedure. From there, it was directed to the District Policy Committee this last Monday and now to you tonight. The District Policies Committee decided that, the re that requiring faculty to avoid intentionally attempting to weaken a student's faith would be too difficult to enforce, so they recommended that the policy be deleted. I disagree most strongly, but it seems their minds are made up. So I will recommend the following. The policy committees are working on a due process policy. Please include language that not only outlines the basic rights owed to faculty and staff, but clear steps that can be taken when faculty or staff violate district policies. With every right comes an equal, opportun uh, an equal responsibility. Perhaps when that policy is passed, future protections of our students can be implemented to protect all of their rights, including the freedom of the district faculty intentionally attacking their faith. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that, before Connie steps up, anyone else that would like to comment on this item? This is the second time it's been to the to the board, so I want to make sure I'm getting a no. Okay, Connie, it's all it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening again. So you have eight second readings before you on board policy, and then of course we offer the admin procedures as information to you. Five of them we have some edits on. They did all go through the. Uh, constituent review process and uh, we spoke about them on Monday at the board policy committee meeting so let me let me say uh, let me go through those the the edits the five edits were at your chair today and if you want we can step through those uh, we are looking at 6400 the board policy where we will include the Board Finance Committee on line 18 and the full Board of Trustees when we have um, audits that we need to, to look at and reports. So you'll see the changes in red. Moving on to 6850, hazardous materials. In the AP, we had a number of recommended edits for clarification, and so I don't need to go through all of those if you've read them. And uh, moving on to 7125, verif verification of eligibility for employment. In the AP, again, clarified, uh, didn't make substantive change other than just to spell out what the cards, um, the card specific card names are. So you'll see that in the AP line 10. Moving on to communicable disease, 7330. Again, in the AP, we had uh, just some words that would be a little bit easier to read. Rather than unfitting the applicant, we say things like, which makes the applicant unfit. So just some clarifications. And then on 7336, the last one with edits, again, just in the AP, on lines 21 and 24, we just made um, some edits so that it would be easier to read. 
And then I'll make one last comment on 4-8067, and please, Trustee DiMartini, you're at the Monday meeting. If you'd like to help me out there, that's great. But what I recall from that meeting is that that is, only, that is a recommendation from that subgroup of the board, and so the recommendation came forward to continue on with the deletion of that policy with the idea that the Academic Senate is taking up a conversation to potentially have uh, information that was in that policy potentially um, included in syllabi for faculty. And also that the necessary text from that policy is available in 4030 Academic Freedom, 3900 Time, Place, and Manner, and then also the non-discrimination policy was brought up. So that was the recommendation by the Board Policy Committee to this group for a decision. What about Mr. Howland's additional point? Does anybody, staff or public, have a comment on that? What is the additional point? I'm sorry. To include in the due process. Including due process. Well, um, an intriguing we've been, point to me. So yeah, I, yeah. We've been we've been working on due process for a number uh -huh. of years, um, and and so I know that the board is very interested, and they've they've made recommendations on how to move forward in that. One thing, just hearing that the first time, it's certainly something that can be considered, obviously, through the policy process. But one thing that came to mind is adding in things of discipline and what will happen to a faculty member. Those things really tend to live in the contract rather than in policy um, items, items of discipline and, and things like that. So that's the first thing that comes to mind, but it's certainly all open and, and any recommendations can be made and will be looked at with the same same openness. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Chair Garrett. Um, I would like to um, spend a little bit of time on this policy because um, I'm, I'm the chair of the board policy and procedure committee and I'm the only one here that's on it tonight. Um, the board was very, this, the three of us, Leslie and Lynn, and I um, were very concerned that we not do anything to interfere with academic freedom for faculty. We were very concerned about that a month ago, and we still are. But we're also concerned that we're aware of situations. They may not be frequent, but there are situations where students have been harassed because of their religious or political beliefs in class. There are situations when they've been unfairly targeted, and occasionally they've had their grades affected. And the concern of, of the committee was that we don't want to interfere at all with academic freedom of faculty, but we don't want to interfere with academic freedom of students either. And I think we came up with a compromise that even though we're dropping this, Jim, you have the right to disagree with me, but I think that the compromise that was discussed with Curtis, which he will bring or has already started to bring to the Academic Senate, is that if we make students more aware, they don't go through and read the board policies. I mean, we don't even know all of them. Yeah. But if, if on a syllabus, if, if we could have on every syllabus that a student gets for a class, have a copy of the academic freedom for faculty and a copy of the academic freedom for students and a copy of the um, code of ethics, just not all of it, just like one paragraph. Curtis will take this to Senate and they will let us know what they think from the AAUP about respecting students. And students have the right not to believe, but they must learn all course material. The, the committee felt that the even with the um, proposal to change, you can't say a, a professor will not intentionally weaken the faith of a student because you can't define that word intentionally. It, it's too subjective, and so we, we felt that even with that suggested change, we couldn't go with it. But um, we feel that if, if, if it's so deemed by the Senate and is brought to us that we could add these two policies, possibly even the policy on harassment, it is not legal to harass someone on their religious beliefs. If we could even have that in the syllabus, we think that that would empower students a lot more than just having this policy that they'll actually never see. So I feel good about 
the proposed solution. We're on good faith. I'm recommending to the board that we eliminate this policy, but are anxiously looking forward to what comes back to us from the Senate about the idea of including that on the syllabus. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. For me, um, two, a couple things. Uh, when looking at this policy, it's a balancing act. And, and when you go through that process, and, and Jim, I want to thank you for bringing this to our attention. I know this wasn't what you wanted, but you still brought something to our attention that allowed all of us to participate in a dialogue, and that's always healthy. Um, but I, when I looked at this and looked at it again, it, it, it really, for me, leans towards academic freedom. And I, and I think that uh, having gone through the process, uh, through the participatory process, uh, as, a, as a board member, there are times when uh, you, you have to uh, honor that process. I'm not giving you 100% commitment, but there are times when you have, to, you, know, you have to honor that process. And I wanna thank the Academic Senate and the work of, of Ann and the committee for bringing back a compromise that I think will work. I really do. Well, I think it's gonna work. So with that, I'll bring it back to the board uh, for the um, items for the uh, second reading, correct, Connie? I'll follow up uh, on that, uh, Mr. Chair. I, uh, it sound, I, I like the input of the Senate and the idea that this could be open to due process, and I thank Ann especially for the uh, comments uh, that you made. I, I feel much better about it. It is a tricky area. I, I was sitting here thinking about it. What's the example? Well. I can remember, whatever it's numbered now, but my philosophy 101 class from Ben Starr, 1981, and I'm a, a young man of faith sitting there, and he's telling me to make, uh, you know, back up the argument against the cosmological and the various arguments of the existence of God, and so it is a tricky, <laughs> it is a tricky area for folks, and I agree with uh, the chair that you, we need to err on the side of academic freedom. And I'll just add that, trust me, in the many years, longer than it needed to take, that I was here at MJC, um, having a law enforcement officer sitting in their classroom was probably not an easy time for any faculty member. So, uh, but they did it with professionalism and decorum, and I never had a problem. So bring that back. Uh, is there a motion to, to approve this second reading? I move that we approve all of the second readings tonight. Okay. Motion second. by... Motion by Trustee Demartini, seconded by Trustee Hallinan. Any further comments or questions? Seeing or hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Moving to the last item, 7.8. That is the Board of Trustees 1819 Special Priorities. And those, those the special priorities were included in your, in your packet. And I'll look at Graciela. They're really not changing a whole lot, are they? No. Not at all. I move we approve the special priorities. For 1819, moved by Trustee Demartini. Is there a second? Second, second by Trustee Viss. For any further comments or questions? Just one comment. You know, I, I fought for just having a few special priorities for years. I leave the board for one year and you get them down to four. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you would. No, I'll just leave it at that. So. <laughs> anyway. All right, so we've had a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So carried. Um, okay, now it's, and I and first want to just say, I want to thank each and every one of you for your patience, allowing us to get through this, this business portion of the meeting. Now I'll turn it over to you. It's, it's your turn. And before we just get to that moment, I'm going to read something from Trustee Lynn Martin. Um, Lynn is not here this evening, uh, and it will be explained when I read this. She had a family emergency. So she just wanted to read this out to all of you. It is with mixed feelings that I write to all of you today, or speak with all of you today. I had intended to be at this meeting, but the rapidly declining health of my brother-in-law in Houston, Texas, has created the need for me to travel there sooner than I had planned, and am extreme, and am currently, uh, very probably as you are listening to this note, in West Texas. I have enjoyed my two terms on the board. I trust I have represented Area 1 completely uh, competently as well as the district at large 
while I will miss the interactions with fellow board members and district personnel, as well as staff at both colleges, I am looking forward to full retirement and what that holds. I would like to thank all of the staff of the district, as well as the board, for continually putting students first. In particular, I would like to thank Graciela Molina, for not only for her professional skill, but for going above and beyond to make sure that I, that I, uh, make sure that I and I am sure all board members have been served far beyond the parameters of her job description. Our mission entails many things, but at the core of the mission is students. YCCD will always be a part of me, and I am blessed to have been a part of the Yosemite Community College District. And I know I will miss Miss Ann, but uh, she's looking forward to retirement, and I wish her well and Godspeed to her brother-in-law. I have no other requests, so now it's up to you. I just ask that it's been a long evening so far. Try not to be repetitive. We want to hear new ideas. So with that, mob rule, I guess, who wants to go first? So. <laughs> yes. so we have two speakers just right here at the end of where the audiences are. You can make a line. First person can come up and make their comment. Hi, good evening. My name is Ruth Lumen, and I teach in the English Language Department at MJC. We feel our classes are filled with the best students at the college, immigrant and refugee students, seeking to fulfill their fullest potential and contribute to the community. We in the EL Department and in the Literature and Language Arts Division in general counted a real privilege to work with students. It is pure joy, it is the best job, to watch others learn, change, empower themselves, and become upwardly mobile through education. It's more than just a job. Education is nation building, creating a more critically engaged and equitable society, which is crucial for the preservation of a democracy. So it is with this perspective and this concern that we as instructors protect the quality of instruction. In its most recent proposal, the district notes that class capacities will be set by the district up to a potential maximum of 45 students per class. For many of us in composition or language arts classes, this would most likely mean an increase in workload, potentially increases of more than 50%. An increase in students will diminish instructional quality, especially at a time when recent legislation mandates more intensive and accelerated curriculum, requiring more personal support and interaction with students in order to increase student success. And this is for faculty who are already some of the most productive in our cohort and the least paid, faculty for whom the average work week far exceeds the hours already required in the contract. As an instructor in this situation, I need to tell you plainly, any class size increase is untenable. Increasing class size is not an act of fiscal stewardship. It is an act of workforce exploitation, and it is wrong. On the side of the district, it also imperils the ability of the district to attract and retain qualified instructors at the college. A college residing in a community consistently ranked as one of the least educated in the nation. In a professional statewide online listserv discussion this summer in which class caps in composition and language classes were discussed, one colleague in another district noted that even a potential 45 student cap was one of the highest in the state and quote unquote, vomit inducing. There is no crisis to prompt a demand for class size increases that negatively impacts students, teachers, and the community as a whole. It is disturbing and it's disheartening and it's demoralizing that this demand continues to be a driving issue and indeed unnecessary. In the process, it has created long lasting damage in an already fragile relationship between faculty and the district. However, restoration is not impossible, nor is it too late. As Alice Walker once said, anything we love can be saved, if only we will act.
Hey, thank you. Good evening. My name is Leticia Cavazos. Most of you already know me because I was a student here a few years ago. And in December, God be willing, I will have completed 39 years of service to the college and the district. So I love MJC. I'm here um, representing the counseling, and um, I just wanted to say that what we do matters. What we, I, as I look around the room, I see some of my students, and I think you guys know I love you guys, and I would do anything to help you get to where you want to be. So you said, Mr. Chairman, to not repeat. So I'm going to take a different. Um, uh, I'm going to take a different way, and I wanted to share with you a letter that a parent sent me because his son had attempted to transfer to a University of California from high school with a 4.5 GPA and was denied. So he saw this as a second opportunity to transfer to his, the school of his dreams, and he did successfully through the transfer center. So he sent me this really nice letter, and I thought, oh my gosh. He said, Leticia, I wanted to thank you and wanted to let you know that you've not just made a positive impact in my son's life. You and all the counselors, what you guys do have made a positive impact in the lives of hundreds of students. Plus the positive influence that you have contributed to so many has focused out in front of those young lives. There are caring people who rescue others in trouble. They care for those who are sick. They help overcome dependency assist cha change to challenge lives, but much of that, unfortunately, is failure. It's reactive. What you, the counselors, the faculty do, you play a role in the development stages of a young person's life. That is proactive. I guarantee that the positive impact that you've made in front of students has had and will continue to have multiplying effect on them for their life and decades. You may not realize it, but I know that you and all the counselors have helped to positively change the entire course of students' lives. A 19, 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 50-year-old, 60-year-old student comes to your office seeking guidance and transfer strategies. You, get to stretch, you teach them to stretch themselves, to see possibilities. You push them. You lay out realistic short-term goals, long-term goals for them. You get them, you teach them to believe in themselves, that they actually can achieve something that may have only recently seemed unachievable. And the positive echoes of those conversations of hope and encouragement, that will play for the remaining 60, 70, or 80, or 80 years of those students' lives. A better school, something that's better suited, a better career, something that they may pursue may translate into a richer, more content, more fulfilling and satisfying lifetime. And every positive influence, it influences the lives of every student every single day. And he closes, and I thought this really touched me because he said, all of my professional life, I have been involved in banking and specifically commercial real estate lending. I have spent my entire life helping wealthy people become even more wealthy. Working for people who don't care about who I am or about my human condition, as long as I knew my job contributing to the process, it's no wonder that I am burnt out. I'm only a name, and my life has only made a difference in the lives of my immediate family. On the other hand, you, the counselors, the faculty, everything that you do has touched and will continue to touch hundreds of lives. What you do, Leticia, that is an honor. What you do will continue to affect lives. What you do stands for the test of time. Thank you so much for all you do for the students. So I say to you, I do what I do because I love it. And I think my students who are here can attest to that. And so what I, I'm asking you, is to realize that we do make a positive difference in our community. So please, we ask you, make faculty a priority. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and thank you for reading that. Hello, uh, my name is Don Messimer. I'm a student here in the nursing program in fourth semester. Um, I feel that my statements and stuff is relevant because I think I'm representative of many members of the community and many students in this college. Um, I apologize. <laughs> There's more of us outside. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've gone to a lot of schools in my lifetime. I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Laverne. I went to San Jose State University. And by far, I've received the best instruction at this college. I've taken English classes before when I did prereqs when I came back. And I'm a straight-A student here. Um, I've done English, microbiology, anatomy, physiology, speech 101, English 101, Deborah Martin right here taught my physiology class. <laughs> Bill and Ellie taught reasoning in the philosophy, de philosophy department. And every instructor I've had has been incredible. Um, earlier, you guys were talking about the budget. I voted for Measure E. I've been a resident here for 15 years. I live downtown in the college area. I've worked as a paramedic, and I commute to Santa Clara County for American Medical Response. I've done that for 25 years. I've seen the worst of people in my job. <sighs> I've seen the best of people. Um, I've seen the best of people here. When I voted for Measure E, I understood that that was to help improve this college and things that enabled instruction. And I've been sitting here in this meeting. This boardroom is amazing, but it does not benefit me as a student. And this Measure E money went to this boardroom. The science building did benefit me. My instructors benefit me. The fact that there is a disagreement about paying them appropriately and raising their class size is insane. The administrators at this college, it's easy for the public to know. There's websites like Glassdoor. We can look up faculty salaries, board member salaries, administrator salaries, what everybody does. I know that the board does not get paid a lot for what you do. I appreciate your service. Zero. OK, but I appreciate what you do. But at the same time, the administrators here do get paid high compared to the other colleges in this area that they're compared to. The instructors do not. And for them to expect to be paid well and comparably is reasonable. Our nursing instructors are amazing. When I graduate as a nurse, I'm going to make more money than they do. They volunteer their time. They get paid, but in my mind, it's volunteering their time. Because they could go work three 12-hour shifts, have four days off a week, and go home at night with no extra work and make more money. And they're doing it because they love it. And the, the college has spent a lot of money in recent years to do things that are nice. We have a nice science building. We have a, a nice, I'm happy there's new parking lots. But at the same time, there's a soccer field over there. And you could put up a pop-up tent and wheelchair ramps to that grass. And put a, under the tent, you could put a video monitor for a lot less money as long as you keep the instructors and pay them so they want to come back so you can retain good quality people. The English instructor who just talked did it much better than I am. 
But that's because they know how to teach this stuff. So please, agree in a contract, compensate them well, because they're what makes this college. There's nothing else that makes this college. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Harmon, and I have a follow-up comment from the last time I was here. So we know that our professors are suffering because the cohort agreement isn't being honored, but it doesn't seem as if you know how the students feel. The community college system is the backbone of education, and its core mission ought to be one that promotes adding value to the community through servicing the community. Now, if board member Dr. Martin was here, she would agree with me, because that's something from the bio of the YCCD website. Sorry, sorry, something from her bio. And I think I know, or I can at least contribute one suggestion on how we can get closer to fulfilling that mission. And that's why I'm remembering something that board member Don Viss, you'll probably remember this, is something that you saved in your bio. It's something called the four C's, character. Setting a strong set of personal moral values that show your dedication to servicing the community, especially the students. The second C, commitment to a sense of civic responsibility, along with the ability to think critically in the interest of collective communal flourishing. Compassion to one's fellow man, including the ones you have authority over. Capacity to enjoy a lifetime of servicing the community which promoted your flourishing. Board member Dr. Martini, in your bio on the YCCD website, you wrote, as a trustee, I have the responsibility to see that our colleges are servicing the needs of our community. Community colleges should provide opportunities for students to gain employment skills and create partnerships with local businesses. Community colleges can also add to the cultural and intellectual well-being of their communities. MJC and Columbia College need to make a positive difference in their respective regions and reach out to all students who want to benefit from a college education. Now, we know all of you ran for your positions because you know you can do this. And you were elected to your positions because we believed you could. And now I invite all of you to show us that you can do this. I invite you to understand that the professors and students suffer together as one people. We, the students, have fulfilled our responsibility in showing you that we stand with the professors. We invite you to fulfill yours by doing the right thing. Settle the contract. Thank you. And I believe I have about one minute left, but very quickly, this is from a former student that's not here. His name is Joel Sanchez. He was here from MJC 2010 to 2013. Right now, he's in the middle of getting his PhD from Stanford in chemical engineering. What? Say what up to Joel. <laughs> and what Joel essentially wanted me to say, I'm going to summarize his heartfelt speech very quickly. Um, he, as a first-generation college student from a low-income family, didn't even know where to start his path. But it was from the help of Dr. Elzabetta Jurett and Dr. Dan Alcantara in the math department, Dr. Laura Mackey, Dr. Joseph Cattle, Dr. Mary Roslaniak in the chemistry department, to Thomas Nomov, Kenneth Middle in the physics department, the list goes on. But he essentially says, because of those people, he's where he is today, getting a PhD from Stanford. Thank all of you guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. 
I'm not wearing a red shirt because I gave the shirt off my back to a student. And that's actually, I, I honestly feel, I think that's more than metaphorical for most of the faculty at MJC. <clears throat> I teach in the nursing department, and you may think you have straight A's, but you're not done with me yet. <laughs> <laughs> the ADN students at Modesto Junior College comprise the third largest group of graduates at MJC. They are prepared well to enter our program by all the other departments at MJC with prerequisites in science, math, English, and social and behavioral sciences. It's a college-wide effort. Our students pass the California State Nursing Board exam within one year with percentage passing rates in the high 90 percentages. 86 to 90% of our students, our graduates, are employed in Stanislaus and Tuolumne County. They will take care of you. <laughs> Actually, you'll be lucky if they take care of you. <laughs> this last May, 428 fully qualified students applied for entry into our ADN program. Only 100 were accepted, 20 of whom will be up at Columbia, will graduate up there, and will work in that part of, our, of the community. California is in 50th place for the nursing shortage. That means we are more in need of nurses than any other state in our country. Our region is fortunate to have such stellar nurses entering the workforce. Ironically, many of our graduates will earn more upon graduation than those of us who have prepared them. We currently have 15 full-time nursing faculty, all mastered prepared nurses with years, mostly decades, of experience in the hospital and in education. These faculty give the ADN students the education they deserve and need to be excellent practitioners. They will take care of you and your families. Last year, our team of 15 worked with one vacant full-time faculty position. How did we do this? With a lot of blood, sweat, and a lot of tears in some cases. Two faculty doing the work of three because nobody would take that position. We couldn't find anybody who would take that position. I personally know three master's prepared nurses who would be excellent instructors and who would love to teach with us, but they won't. They cannot afford the $20,000 to $40,000 cut in salary to be professors at Modesto Junior College. At this rate, who will teach our students? This year, we are short two full-time faculty. And it goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Just, just come on up. Hi. Hi. My name is Naomi. Um, I am a, t a student here at MJC. I've had the pleasure of taking Melanie Brew's class, um, which has then turned into a mentorship. Someone, she's someone who has been a mirror, um, helping me realize that students and myself can come into our full potential. Seeing representation at this campus matters. Um, however, I can't be certain that I would have had the opportunity to grow as a student and her mentee as her mentee had the class size been bigger. Um, not only will students be affected by this, um, but so will the teachers. Um, teachers play a crucial role as to who we become. Um, it's only fair they get paid what they were promised and what they deserve. You can find plenty of teachers who will teach you the course material. However, you cannot find 
teachers who will teach with passion. That is something that you cannot teach. You can't teach someone to be as passionate um, about whatever they're teaching as some of these teachers at MJC. So not only do we need to take care of our teachers who we have, because yes, some can re be replaced, but their efforts and the way they make students feel cannot. Thank you. Next. Uh, hi, you guys. Uh, I'm Al Smith. I teach history at MJC. I'm also the uh, faculty coordinator for the Emoja program. <laughs> so I'm re representing a couple of constituencies here. Uh, one are our students, of course, but the other, of course, are, are our faculty. Um, you're not moved. You're not moved by tears. You're not moved by numbers, which are in the favor of the faculty, you're, you're apparently not moved by common sense. And I'm not trying to be insulting or anything, I'm, I'm simply stating a fact that I see from behavior. The s situation is that one of the things I teach in history is I teach honor. I teach respect, I teach responsibility, and I teach a, a sense that I have responsibility to my students and to my community. I'm not gonna talk too long up here today, because I'm kinda heated. But what I want you to understand is that you, right now, every time every one of these instructors have had to stand up in front of their class and explain the situation, you're teaching. And you're not teaching honor. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Ram, and I'm a first-year student here. So, um, though I had many things to um, prepare to speak, but I would um, speak quite briefly. Um, and in my opinion, I would say that all policies um, which are to be made and decided by your honorable body regarding the deadlock issue, um, certainly efforts should be made to mutually reconcile um, quality and quantity, but with the consideration in mind that quality should prevail over all other aspects. Thank you. Hello, board. <laughs> Um, first, I want to start with this. When I entered MJC, I was still on probation. Juvenile Hall was just right here. I had to check in with my probation officer to make sure that I was coming to college. I didn't know nothing about college. I was, uh, I was expelled from high school. I went back, then I dropped out. And it was just, education was just didn't seem like a place for me. But when I came to um, MJC, uh, due to my probation officer making me come back to get my education, <laughs> I honestly did not expect that I was even going to graduate a community college. Um, I honestly was scared of speaking. I'm still shaking. <laughs> um, I didn't know how to write an essay. I didn't know how to complete sentences. I mind you that my education was not supportive. Not I graduated by independent studies by professors, by teachers who didn't really even care in the uh, independent study um, section. And so when I came into MJC, not only did I felt scared, but I started to have hope. And I had hope because I met professors here that actually cared for their students. My first professor was Miss Elizabeth David. So many times I cried to her that I wanted to drop out because I don't think I was made to come to college. 
but she, she kept listening to me. She kept telling me that she's there for me, like a counselor, because she was also a counselor. And she pushed me to, to join clubs, to, to do anything that I want, because I'm capable to do anything that I want, regardless of where I come from. Next thing I knew, I was MJC co-chair, I mean, Mecha co-chair, I was the senator of diversity, I was in BSU, I was in, um, I mean, all these things. <laughs> and I became a student leader. And I didn't even know I was capable of, of doing this. And then I had my professors. I really want to give a shout out to Ms. Melanie Baru, Professor Al Smith, Eric, because they always fought for us, for the students. They cared for us, and they were there for us through the good times and the bad times. And with their support, I was able to graduate MJC. I went to UC Santa Cruz, and I graduated this year with my bachelor's. And I have to admit, I grew a lot because I knew I had their support. And the UC system is really hard. A quarter system, I'm just, OK, I don't know what to do here. But I still had support. <laughs> I had support from professors from here, from NJC, because this is where I grew. This, is, this institution, this MJC college is what made me who I am now. And that's why I want to come back and support my professors. My mentors, I could call them tias, tios, <laughs> and I just really want you all to really consider, to really think about the professors who make an impact, especially faculty of color, who go beyond and mentor a lot of us students that are really like first generation immigrants, backgrounds like mine. I just really hope you all take that into consideration. Hold on just a moment. I'm, gonna, I'm glad we're now hearing from the students, so I want to thank you. Uh, we're going to do one more uh, speaker. But first, you probably saw me stand up for that young lady. I'm not commenting on what she said, I can't do that. I'm commenting about who she is and what she's accomplished. Um, some of you may know I spent 27 years in law enforcement and I'm the chair of the Juvenile Justice Commission for this county. I don't think you quite appreciate how rare it is for a, a person of her background, what she has overcome, to stand up and speak here, let alone accomplish what she has accomplished. So that's why I stood up and, and gave her some extra amount of respect. So over to you, young man. Thank you, Chairman, members of the board. Um, thank you for allowing me some of your time. I don't want to take too much of it. Uh, I'm a Modesto Junior College student uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, this is my fourth semester. I've been taught by a wide variety of teachers here from uh, ranging a wide variety of different academic subjects. And I just want to say that I have never met a single instructor from Modesto Junior College who did not give their absolute 100% in ensuring that the students here got the best education that they could. And I stand by them, and I support them, and I believe that they should get the legal compensation that they deserve. And I support our staff. And I've had many teachers here, and they have uh, inspired me, and they've educated me, and I'm a much more powerful human being now than I was four years ago when I started here. I'd like to thank every single teacher here, and I stand with you, and I support you, and yes, that's all I want to say. Thank you. We're going to take one more because you've been standing for a while, so go ahead. Uh, 
hello, my name is Jacob Magana. I'm a MJC student. It's my first semester, although I have gone to two other colleges. And I must say that I, I'm not, I wasn't really sure why I was here when I first walked in, but after seeing all these people speaking and kind of realizing that this is a process of democracy and that everybody that came here did so because they feel that it's important to speak up for them, not only for themselves, but for these, uh, the faculty and for the administrators. I mean, I feel like everyone's here because they feel like they need to be. And I truly feel like without the people, the teachers specifically, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be taking the steps to step up for the teachers because without their support, I honestly don't know where I would be right now. After going to, after graduating high school, I went to a private university for a year. I was going to school for business. I realized that that's not what I wanted. I went to a tra uh, another community college after that for a semester, realized that that wasn't where I needed to be. Took a whole year off of school and kind of was just floating around and then somehow ended up at NJC. And that experience has been life changing because I finally know what I want to do and I have the teachers to thank for that. And I honestly feel like that the things that they do for us are highly undervalued because the knowledge that they're giving us is about, it's, you couldn't put a price on it. And they're giving us not just the curriculum, they're giving us parts of themselves. And that's super important because they're teaching us their life lessons. And the time that they put out to be in those classes means the world to me. And I know it means the world to everyone here. And I truly feel like they should be compensated for that because they have families that they need to support, just like anyone else doing a job. And I truly feel like that that's what needs to happen. Otherwise, no, one else, no one's going to leave this feel, place feeling all right. Nobody. Thank that young man and, and uh, thank you all for speaking and I personally want to thank you for your civility and your decorum. Made my job real easy, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to close public comment period and bring it back now to item 4.1, which is the Board Finance Committee report. Uh, we met, hold on a minute here, we met on September 4th. Uh, and we discussed the uh, budget update, much of which uh, was discussed tonight. Uh, the funding formula, which our vice chancellor got into, and then the 1819 budget, which obviously puts you to sleep out there while you're hearing it. So um, we pretty much covered everything in that meeting that you heard tonight. So that's all I have. And now we'll move on to item um, 4.2, which is the board policy committee report. And I'll turn that over to the chair. Um, Chair Garrett, I feel that I essentially gave the report when we considered the second reading of the policies. So thank you. All right, we'll move on now to item uh, 5.1, association reports. And we'll start first with the student uh, uh, senate activity reports. And I know we have a young lady that's out in the, in the wings. There we go, all right. Good evening, members of the board. Um, so starting with today's report, ASMGC members started the semester by welcoming the students during Welcome Week, which was a three-day event. The event included free snacks, school supplies, and activities for students. Yesterday, ASMGC members participated in the Remembrance Day event and set up 2,996 flags to commemorate the victims of 9-11. Today, ASMGC members participated in the Club Rush on East Campus and will be attending the Club Rush on West Campus tomorrow. Also, ASMGC members participate in the flow, which is free lunch on Wednesday on both East and West Campus. On September 17, ASMGC members will celebrate the Constitution Day by handing out Constitution to the students. On September 19, ASMGC members will attend the Pirates Promotion Day. On this day, we will be celebrating MJC's 97th birthday by giving out free food to students. We will also be celebrating our mascot, PD the Pirate, by setting up fun activities for students. Thank you. Any questions for A? No, 
Is there any questions for me? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Shalom Fletcher and I am the student body president for Columbia College. I am honored to be here tonight to represent the students for Columbia. To start off, I want to say that our new student welcome kickoff um, for Columbia's Welcome Week activities. Um, the Associated Students of Columbia College were involved in many of these activities with one of the highlights being the free club day and barbecue which served over 600 students. The ASCC also spent many office hours providing students with their student IDs, which are in great demand due to the new Enroll Now and Ride for Free opportunity. All students living in either Calaveras or Tuolumne County can ride the transit bus for free to any destination within the two counties with the current college ID. This service is co-sponsored by Tuolumne County Transit, Columbia College Foundation, and the Associated Students of Columbia College. The ASCC's next event will be the Constitution Day, Monday, September 17th, 9 to 1 p.m. The ASCC will have an opportunity for students to learn more about the U.S. Constitution through interactive games and a short um, test knowledge quiz. Students will also receive a copy of the U.S. Constitution. We are also getting ready for Claim Jumper Day, Thursday, September 20th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., Columbia has invited high school faculty and students throughout the tri-country area and beyond to tour our campus and explore what our various programs have to offer. On another topic, students have heard rumors going around regarding the state of no no negotiations with the YFA. We have invited Eric Andel and Nate Ryan to attend our next Senate meeting to answer any questions regarding where, where they are at in the negotiation. We are also going to invite Brian Sanders to get a full scope of information. At this time, I want to encourage all parties to come to a resolution and to keep in mind of what kind of impact it would have on the students if these issues do not get resolved. At the end of the day, we are all here to serve students. I look forward to seeing you all at our next uh, meeting at Columbia College. If you have any questions. Any questions? Well, I'd just like to thank you. That's your first report to the board, and you did very well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now here, we'll hear from Jim Salman, the YFA. Good evening, my name is Jim Salman and I'm president of the Yosemite Faculty Association. In 2006, the district and YFA negotiated a cohort of comparable college districts. The YCCD promised a goal of compensating faculty at the median of the cohort. Not the top, but the median. A modest but important promise one that is enshrined in our collective bargaining agreement. Today, 12 years later, faculty in the Yosemite Community College District are at the bottom of the negotiated cohort and have suffered a loss in real earnings. With the district's current offer of 6%, or more accurately, 2% per year over the life of the contract, we will remain ranked ninth out of 11 districts in the cohort and suffer a loss of real earnings relative to the consumer price index for both the Stanislaus and Tuolumne counties, both of which have been at 3% per year. With the district's current offer, faculty would be, would be making less in real earnings than we did three years ago. During the Great Recession, and even immediately afterward, faculty were willing to accept compromise proposals that kept us at the bottom of the cohort in the sake of mutual sacrifice. To ask us to do the same now during the greatest economic expansion in over a generation is unbearable. 
our willingness to sacrifice was cynically exploited, with the YCCD now pursuing last place as the new normal and where the faculty are expected to descend down the ladder of success and even worse, be grateful for it. There is no justification for this free fall in salary nor the district's gross repudiation of its promise to the faculty. Both the board and the YCCD administration should be ashamed of letting these negotiations reach this crisis. It is self-inflicted and born of bad faith. The FTES is stable. Faculty productivity is high. And most importantly, the district's own budget shows that it is currently experiencing its greatest fiscal growth in decades. The final budget that was adopted tonight on action item 7.2 confirms $9 million in increased revenue for this year over last and a projected multi-million dollar ending surplus. Even before the addition of this new revenue, the budget had already set aside $3 million to cover the first portion of any salary proposal for faculty. The budget has also separately set aside millions for every other district contingency and money to cover future STRS and PERS expenses, even after the accounting for all these potential expenses, and even after providing administrative raises, and even after spending inordinately on consultants. There still remains a multi-million dollar ending balance that far exceeds the state required 5%, which means that anything above that is surplus. It is undisputed that the district's offer will not keep up with the consumer price index um, <clears throat> and will keep faculty at the bottom of the cohort. It is undisputed that the district can easily afford to bring faculty to the median without risk to its current or future fiscal health. And it is undisputed that the district promised faculty that it would always have the goal of providing median compensation to faculty. The district simply has no argument, and even worse, does not appear to care. It tries to reject the mutually negotiated cohort rather than acknowledge the low salaries it reflects. For the last two years of negotiations, since the faculty contract expired, median is all that faculty have asked for in our compensation. And in asking the district to do nothing more than just simply keep its promise, we have been treated with blatant contempt, resulting in the YCCD literally ignoring us for six months one half a year, despite its empty rhetoric of a desire to settle this contract. The district has not even tried to argue that it cannot afford to pay, and any such claim would be clearly laughable. Instead, the district has just flatly refused to honor its promise without any consideration for our livelihoods, for our families, or for the work that we do every day for the students of this district. As you may know, faculty are currently in the midst of a strike authorization vote. Look behind me if you want to know what the outcome will be. And look outside in the overflow room and in the lobby to see our other colleagues and our friends and our families and our neighbors and our students who came to support us tonight if you are trying to gauge community sentiment. And then... Look at your own final budget that you adopted tonight if you want to know the outcome of fact-finding. The faculty regret that it has come to this, but it has always been avoidable, and the Yosemite Community College District alone has the onus of responsibility for this current course of action. But we refuse to be treated with disdain. We refuse to lose real earnings, and we refuse to meekly accept the district's broken promises, both unjustified and unfair. We look to our brothers and sisters in West Virginia and in Arizona and in Oklahoma as examples of what educators can achieve when they stand together. The Yosemite Faculty Association asked this district to do the right thing, to honor its promise to the faculty, and to start showing us some respect 
because frankly, we have already earned it. After that, I don't, I don't thank you, Jim. Um, bring it to the uh, CSEA. Is there anyone here from CSEA? I didn't see one earlier. Oh, coming? Okay. Who else is here? Okay. Good evening, board. Good evening. Um, you know, this is kind of ironic that I'm standing up here tonight, so my speech tonight was to thank the board, uh, thank Catherine Pritchard, thank the district team, my own negotiation team, uh, for finally coming to a um, tentative agreement. Um, but I do have a couple um, elephants in the room that I think I would like to just address. Um, so first of all, I'm going to apologize for turning my back, but I would kind of like to talk to the faculty. So just so you guys are aware, this was probably bad timing. It wasn't anything that we expected ours to come at the same time that this is all happening tonight. So I apologize for that. It was not anything that we are in your face that this is, is happening. The other thing that I want to say is I look at all these students, and I look at these faculty, and I want you to know that have the utmost respect for you and the students and what you guys do. And I would also like to ask that as a collective unit, you have the same respect for the classified unit. I know that sometimes when we're looking at our own, you know, blinders, we say and do things that are a little offensive to the other side. And if we could just as a team, because as I look at these students, that's what we are here for. Classified faculty and administration for our students. So I just wanted to remind you guys of that. And to all the students, thank you for getting up here. 